If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new person, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Good morning. Let's, let's stand together. I talked to an old college friend yesterday. He lives, he told me he lives the furthest part north possible on the Atlantic in Maine. And I said, so how's the weather? He goes, oh, it's, you know. <laughs> He goes, you're still in Florida, right? I go, yeah, but boy, it's cold down here. All is relative, right? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of gathering together in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we would just ask you help us to hear from you and to, of course, respond to you, to your word, to your spirit, to your love for us. And Lord, just open your word. By your word, may you, Lord, continue the shaping and forming of our lives into your image. Help us, Lord, to be surrendered to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Grab a seat if you would. A Danish Christian philosopher by the name of Soren Kierkegaard, perhaps you've heard of him, tells a story about a powerful, wealthy, highly respected king who fell in love with a poor peasant woman in a village. He was rich, he was famous, he was powerful, and so he said, how can I know for sure that it's, well, that it's me she loves and not my position, not my money? I mean, of course, he could take an armed escort to her door and demand by his power or decree by his authority that she marry him, be his bride. Or he could come and shower her with gifts and wealth and win her by that way. But he he didn't want a fearful slave or someone who wanted him just because of his riches. He wanted it to be spontaneous. He wanted it to be happy. He wanted it to be real. He didn't want to buy her. He wanted to know that she loved him for who he was, not his power, not his wealth, not his position. Somehow he had to find a way to win her love without overwhelming her or dominating her with his position, his power. He wanted love to be Well, he wanted it to be equal. And so he clothed himself as a peasant, and he went to her. But he he didn't just dress as a peasant, as a person from a humble village. He actually became poor. He he, he loved her so much, he, he wanted true relationship, so he left his throne, his wealth, his royal power uh, to, to win her love. And, and in many ways... This is the story told by John in his gospel. This is Jesus, the king, the the creator, the the source of all life and light. He's come to earth as one of us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. God became poor. God became humble, subjected himself to hunger, to pain, to temptation, to rejection, to everything that you and I go through. And he does this because, well, he loves us, and he wants to win our love. In the Gospel of John, you see the love of God in in all kinds of amazing ways. We, We have in the Gospel of John those unforgettable words, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Last week we saw in John's gospel the love of God for an outcast, the woman of Samaria. And I want to take just a few minutes to kind of 
set the stage about John's writing in his gospel because it's different than Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are similar in the fact that they, they kind of report stories and incidences and things in the life of Christ. John's writing is different. It's different in the events. It's different in the stories. It's different even in its purpose. In John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, he, he tells us what his purpose is. It says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Then he gives us, John does, his reason. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. John says, this is why I'm writing. This is, this is my a story. It's, and if you read through the Gospel of John, and it's a, it's a powerful read, it's like reading someone's diary. John is very personal. He does it with great intent and purpose. And at the end of his gospel, John asks for a verdict. He asks for a decision. He wants the reader of his story, of his gospel, to, to, to make a choice. To, to Now, what do you believe? Is Jesus God's son? Is Jesus who he claims to be? And, and if you believe, or if I believe and, and accept his claims, his promises... Well, I have life eternal. If I reject, John says I'm separated from God for for all eternity. John uses very specific words in his gospel, like the word father. He uses the word father 127 times. He uses the word believe 92 times. He uses the word Jesus, the name Jesus, 247 times in his gospel, God 77 times, and the phrase word 35 times. The gospel of John is an amazing revelation of Christ and his love for you and I. Seven times you see the phrase, I am. I am the light, I'm the bread, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And and the interesting thing about John, it's, it's, it's interesting to me at least that Scholars believe that John was probably somewhere in the age of 15 or 17 when Jesus called him from the fishing. Just a teenager. John was one of those who was in the upper room of the 120 when the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost. John was one of the 70, if you know the story, when Jesus sent out 70 in that first evangelistic campaign. John obviously was one of the 12, hand-chosen and picked personally by Jesus. And John was one of those, well, those inner three that you read about, Peter, James, and John, who Jesus would take aside sometime, like the time that he raised Jairus' daughter. He put everyone out except for Peter, James, and John. Like the time that he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, he only took Peter, James, and John up there with him. John was there in Gethsemane, and in Matthew, it tells us that he went to pray, and he took Peter, James, and John a little further with him. John has this relationship and, and this intimacy with Jesus. Like It's just an interesting story if you look into John's world. John was the last living of the 12 apostles. He even outlived the apostle Paul. You can imagine as John, you know, was, was getting older and all the other disciples had passed and Paul has passed from the scene, that people would have all kinds of questions. So, John, you, you walked with Jesus, yeah. You spent time with him day after day. You, you were there with him on the mount, this, this. You know, what was he like? Can you imagine? Tell, tell me, what was Jesus like? What did his voice sound like? Was it high? Was it low? Was it gargly? What did he sound like? What was it like when he laid hands on people and prayed for him, John? 
Did he have a sense of humor? Did Jesus laugh? Was he moody? Was he neat? Was he messy? What kind of food did Jesus like? John was the last one who was alive that really knew Jesus closely and was chosen to walk with him. Some scholars say he was probably almost 90 when he passed away. The average lifespan in that day and that time was 40 to 50 years old. This young boy, John, who would lean on the breast of Jesus and say, I'm the one that Jesus loved. He writes this journal. He writes this diary. He writes this story for us, and he opens it up. In John chapter 1, he says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Some scholars have said that in John's gospel, he only uses about 600 words. That is, that his vocabulary would be that of an average six-year-old today. He was a simple man. And in these first simple but extremely powerful, profound verses, verse 1 and 2 of his diary of his gospel, he says, in the beginning was the Logos. God's expression of himself, the already existing word was was God and was in the beginning. The word was eternal. It was with God. It was God. He, He says, really, God was the word. John, who also wrote Revelation, I'll just read a verse for you. When, when Jesus is coming back in that revelation of Jesus Christ, he says, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. John John paints this picture for us. You know, all things were, verse 3, were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. This logos, this word, this this express image of God, he, he created, he designed all things. Not some freak cosmic explosion where you and I, you know, eventually slithered out of pond scum and became who we are today. John doesn't begin his gospel once upon a time, millions and millions and millions of years ago. Through adaptation and evolution, we developed into upright talking human beings. If adaptation and evolution were real, don't you think people like in Polar areas or Arctic areas would have fur on their bodies by now. Moms would have four arms at least. Kids would have four thumbs to play video games. See, see, I want you to listen. There is a living, eternal, all-powerful God, and the Bible says that you and I were formed fearfully and wonderfully made by him. That's what the Bible says. His hand is on your life, believe it or not. He knows your beginning. He knows your end. He loves you. He has a plan for you and desires a relationship with you. In fact, he humbled himself and he became a man. He became flesh and he dwelt among us to reveal to us the grace and the love of God. He's not some distant powerful being that we can't know. He, he's a, well, he's a father. John uses that word and the word shepherd, which is, which is an endearing, you know, picture, a father, a shepherd. He uses that word interchangeably 127 times in his gospel. And he'll talk over and over and over again about the wonder of his love and how all things were made by him. Listen to verse 3 again. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light would shine in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Darkness can't take hold of it, can't conquer it. It tells us there in verse 4, that, that in him was life, and the life was the light of men. We, we through Jesus Christ, and I, I believe this with all my heart, we are taken out of darkness 
the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light through Jesus Christ. And light is a word in the scripture. It's a symbol that's used for truth. It's used for knowledge. It's used for understanding. The the light shines in the darkness. Truth comes into that which is untrue. And you don't have to prove light. it, It repels darkness when it comes on. That's just what it does. Just shine a light into the dark, and the darkness begins to disappear. I mean, you can go home tonight, close the blinds, the curtains, turn out the light, and it gets dark. How do you remove it? Well, you don't, you don't vote it out. You don't riot out with a baseball bat. Hey, let's get rid of this darkness. You, you, you don't protest it out. You just turn on the light. You share the truth, his word, his love, his reality, and people can experience life, eternal life. We, through God's love and truth, we, we, we come out of the darkness into that which is real. In, in the first three verses here, John introduces us to Jesus, this amazing man from Nazareth, this, this humble king who gives his love, who, who seeks ours, and he says, this man, this God, this, this Jesus is, is the creator of all things and the source of all truth and the source of all life. In him was life, verse 4, and the life was the light of men. You know, in the, in the 70s, back there in the dark ages, some of us lived back then, there was a song by a group of guys named Simon and Garfunkel. Maybe you've heard of them. They had a song that was, was very famous called Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. And I don't think they were just talking about darkness outside or shadows, but I I think what they were really talking about was a darkness that's inside. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Those things that kind of rumble around in our hearts and minds and our our life that, 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 that we know are dark deceitful heart, a dark heart, capable of all kinds of things, darkness that defiles and destroys. There's a lot of dark things in our culture. And Simon and Garfunkel, I think we touched a nerve by saying, hello, darkness. You know, I, I could define all kinds. Adultery is, is dark defiles marriages and families. Violence is dark. The devaluing of human life is dark. We see it in the murders and the shootings and the suicides and the drug abuse and the alcoholism and the hatred. And here's what I love about John's diary, John's gospel, is that he says Jesus came to set us free from that inner darkness as well. John says, there was a man, verse 6, sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness. Of course, he's talking about John the Baptist. To bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He wasn't the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. John the Baptist comes to herald. He comes to announce. He a prophet to prepare the way. He uses the term bear witness. Referring there to John the Baptist, and John would take the truths of God and try to make them plain and prepare the way, level the ground, so to speak. John's John's name means gracious gift. And God in his love sends grace, this wonderful gift, to clear the road, to prepare the way, to announce his coming. And he identifies him. He was not the light, John, but was sent to bear witness to the light. And he tells us who the light is. He points us to Jesus. Jesus is our way. Listen, Jesus is our way out of the darkness into the true light of God. 
This was the true light, verse 9, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and, and well, the world was made through him, and the world didn't know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. John the Apostle tells us this, that Jesus is the light. He's the eternal God. He is the creator. He's life. He's light. All truth, all light, all creation comes from him. And he's speaking of Jesus. Now you might say, well, John, just a minute. What about people who never hear about Jesus? What about people who grow up in a world who, who don't know Jesus? How can they be held accountable for, for this light, for, for this, this truth? Well, John says that this is the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He, he says all people are exposed to the light, to this light. Romans would, would say it like this. Listen to this, and, and pay attention to this verse because... Paul is quoting a verse that I want to share right after this. He says, Paul talking about this light that we all are exposed to. He says, how then shall they call on him whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? And then he says, as it is written. How are people going to call if they never hear? How are people going to believe if they don't ever know? He says, well, as it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, who has believed our report? So the faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? He said, oh, yeah, they've heard. Their sound has gone out to all the earth, and the words to the ends of the world. And Paul is quoting a psalm, and this is the psalm he quotes. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun. And what he's saying is that creation itself speaks to every single person. There is no one, Paul is saying, that, that has not heard of God or realizes that God exists. John says it. Paul says it. The Psalms agree with it. His witness not only comes people, but from people like John the Baptist or preachers and people like you and I, but creation itself. It, it's, it's woven throughout nature that there's a God, that he's real. Doesn't matter your race, your language, your IQ, where you live geographically, your politics, if you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, you can look up into the heavens and see his message, see his light. And the message is that God is, that God created. The heavens declare God's glory, the work of his hand, his, his majesty, the amazing you know, precision of the orbits, the placement of the earth, the sun, the moon, the genetic codes within our bodies, the, the simple proof that's obvious to any eye that there's a cosmic designer, that there just is. All of the complex, fine-tuned minutiae of galaxies, the human body, the earth, can, cannot be a blind chance. I mean, it would be like this. We're accustomed to hurricanes and tornadoes. I mean, so suppose in, there was an explosion in an old junkyard full of cars and trucks. A giant wind came through, and when the wind calms down and the smoke clears and the storm ceases, instead of a junkyard, well, there would be six new Teslas sitting there, a space shuttle on a launching pad, 
They say, wow, look what that, look what that explosion did. Look what that, that, that's how ridiculous it is that some explosion created all the finite, minute organisms and situations and galaxies and all the things that work together. That's how crazy it would be to say, oh, it just happened. John tells us God has a witness, a light that has revealed truth. And he says that light has been personified in a person. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He created all things. In him is life. It's the light of men. And he came for you. He walked among us, demonstrated in powerful ways God's love and his grace, his power. He he was one who could command the winds and the waves to stand still. And they would sit in the boat and go, what manner of man is this who's in this boat? I mean, imagine if you could walk out today, the icy winds blowing, and you just go, hey, guys, watch this. He brought hope and truth and light to a dark world. He could turn water to wine. He could feed thousands with a few fish and low. John, John is saying this when he opens his story, when he opens his diary, with this one whom he says, I'm the one Jesus loved. He does it with tenderness, but with power and authority. He, he, he says, you know, that uh, the creator stood in our midst. We beheld his glory. The truth, the light that came into the world. And John would go on and he said, he came to his own, his, his own did not receive him, and, and it's, it's the same today. He comes. He'll knock on the door of your heart, and some will, some will realize that there's a way out of the darkness. There's a way out of the condemnation, the guilt, the shame, the loneliness. John says some, some rejected him, but in verse 12, as many as received him, To them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but were born of God. He says, yeah, some rejected him. But those who received him, those who believed in his name, were given the right, the power, the, the privilege, the authority to be God's children. John says, not of natural birth, not of blood, not by inheritance, not by human ancestry, not not I was raised in a Christian family, therefore. You can't inherit faith in Christ. It's not like brown eyes and dimples and, and curly hair. It's not by going through some religious right or being a church member or being baptized or confirmed, not by singing a worship song. None of that makes you a child of God. It's not of human flesh, he says. It's not positive thinking. It's not, hey, I'm sending you some good vibes. It's not positive energy. It's not a New Year's resolution, resolution, I'm going to go to church, I'm going to be a good girl, good boy. It's a gift God gives through His Son, Jesus Christ. Parents can't will it to you, no pastor can hand it to you, no elder, bishop, priest, pope can make you a Christian. No ceremony, rite, or ritual, no, no candle lighting, no standing, sitting, kneeling, creed, confirmation, baptism, none of that. John John declares it very clearly. He says in verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. So it's those who believe and those who receive. See, it's more than just belief. A lot of people say, oh, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, I believe he died on the cross. I believe he rose from the dead. I believe he saves people from their sins. But that doesn't make you a Christian. You might just be halfway there. I believe in George Washington. I've never received him. I've received a few of his pictures. You must receive him. You must believe and receive him. Receive him into your life. Invite him into your heart. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Decide to leave your old life behind. 
then you're born of God. He gives you the right to become the child of God. And you start this process. You know, we, we had three children. They were born to us. We received them into our home. And they, they, had the, they became our children. And the process began of them becoming little Spencer nightmares. And we raised them. You and I come, come into the family. We, we're born when, and we receive Jesus into our hearts. And, and it says, you know, in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. This amazing Savior came. The Bible tells us clearly, If anyone be in Christ, the old can pass away. Behold, all things can become new. Yeah, some reject. Oh, but some, some believe and some receive. Maybe you're here today and you believe in Jesus, but you've never received him. Never really invited him into your heart. And if you haven't, I would, I would say he's knocking, he's calling, he's reaching out to you today. Jesus says, come unto me. All of you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. In the darkness, come into the light. If you will believe and receive, he'll change your life. He'll forgive you of your sins. He'll give you a fresh start. These things are written, John said, that you might know, not guess, not wonder, not think, if am I really, that you might know. That's John's purpose for writing. You can know for sure that you have life everlasting. You know, the Bible says very clearly, today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not next week, but today. And maybe you're here today and you've never really, truly received Jesus Christ as your Savior. I, I want to give you that opportunity in just a few minutes. And I want you to be thinking about what you're going to do. If you're here today and you say, man, I, I, need, a, I need a new start, I, I need forgiveness, I need to come to the Lord, then today is the day of salvation. Maybe you're a prodigal, someone who's drifted away. You know, Peter did. Peter denied Jesus three times. The disciples all scattered, but Jesus restored. Maybe you're here and you need to be restored. Hey, not, nothing wrong with that. Jesus loves to restore. That's one of the greatest things he does. So today, if the Lord is knocking, if he's calling, if he's tugging on your heart, then I'm praying that you'll make a decision. I, I'm praying that you'll believe and that you'll receive the Lord Jesus Christ.